Grab your bear-proof backpack, pack your courage, and join us as we unveil the chilling narratives of the 10 deadliest bear attacks in Glacier Park. It's a wild ride into the heart of the unknown, where the line between survival and tragedy is razor thin, and the majestic bears of Glacier Park command our utmost respect and caution. Hit like and subscribe. This is Fierce. For all your outdoor essentials, visit FierceOutdoor.com. We specialize in gear that keeps you safe and prepared for any wildlife adventure. Gear up for your next trip into the wild at FierceOutdoor.com, where safety meets adventure. Number one, Julie Helgeson, August 12th, 1967. Julie Helgeson, a vibrant 19-year-old with dreams of teaching, and her boyfriend, Roy Ducat, found themselves caught in the midst of this impending catastrophe. Their summer jobs at Glacier Park Lodge had thrust them into nature's embrace like never before. At the stroke of midnight, their tense tranquility was shattered. Julie's hushed voice whispered, play dead, sending a shiver down Roy's spine. In an instant, their haven was torn apart as a massive grizzly bear thrust its head through the tense fabric. Roy's instincts kicked in as he froze, fully aware of the dire situation. The tent was ripped to shreds, and the bear's enormous paw struck Roy with brutal force, sending him flying through the air. His body crashed into the unforgiving ground, and before he could process the pain, the bear lunged at him. Jaws clamped down around his shoulder, and the world became a whirlwind of agony as the bear shook him violently. Julie's screams pierced the night as the bear's attention shifted to her. With terrifying swiftness, she was dragged away from the tent, her desperate cries fading into the inky darkness. Roy, battered and heartbroken, sprinted frantically toward the lodge, desperate for help. Armed with flashlights and in a state of sheer panic, the lodge crew followed Julie's cries for help. They stumbled upon her, a mere 400 feet from their campsite, fighting to hold on to life. They rushed her back to the lodge, summoning a doctor who battled relentlessly to keep her alive. But the bear's vicious attack on her neck and lungs proved to be fatal. At 4.15 on that grim August 13th, Julie's life slipped away, forever altering the world. However, amidst the park's unyielding wilderness, the night held even more horrors as the echoes of tragedy rippled through the woods just eight miles away. Number two, Michelle Coons, August 12, 1967. 19-year-old Michelle Coons was spending her summer as a gift shop saleswoman in the park. On that fateful August 12th, she embarked on a hiking adventure to Trout Lake with her buddies. Now here's the twist in our story. There was a bit of a troublesome bear in the neighborhood. This bear had been on the park ranger's radar, casually strolling back and forth to the garbage cans without a care in the world. Just the week before Michelle's excursion, it had even chased a group of Girl Scouts. As Michelle and her group settled into their campsite, fate played a dark hand in their evening plans. Their uninvited guest, none other than a huge bear. They stood frozen as the bear did its thing, rummaging through their stuff, munching on some snacks, and then casually strolling away. Now they contemplated packing up and hightailing it out of there, but the sun was bidding its farewell and none of them fancied a night hike in the dark. Instead, they relocated their camp closer to the lake and sparked up a blazing bonfire to scare off any nosy bears. In the morning, the bear reappeared, catching everyone off guard. Imagine the shock of finding a grizzly bear just inches from your face. Panic ensued. The group abandoned their sleeping bags, raced to the nearest trees, and scrambled up in sheer terror. However, Michelle didn't manage to join them in their hasty tree-climbing endeavor. Instead, the bear decided to make a closer acquaintance and lunged at her. She struggled with the stubborn zipper of her sleeping bag, a delay that the bear didn't tolerate. It pounced, biting down on her arm as she wrestled with the zipper. While her friends screamed from their tree sanctuaries, attempting to frighten the bear away, it tightened its grip on Michelle's arm and tore it off. In her final moments, she managed to utter these haunting words. Oh my God, I'm dead. The bear quickly grabbed her and disappeared into the dark night, and her friends couldn't hear her screams after a while. They stayed up in the trees, scared and waiting until morning. 
When daylight came, they climbed down from the trees and rushed to the closest ranger station, still feeling really scared. Now, when those rangers finally found Michelle, her injuries were beyond gruesome, rendering her nearly unrecognizable. The sight was etched into their memories forever. When they eventually tracked down the bear, it was a pitiful sight. An emaciated 20-year-old Sal with shards of broken glass embedded in her gums, making eating a painful ordeal. An autopsy revealed a mass of blonde hair in her stomach, confirming they had, in fact, taken down the right bear. After that night, Glacier National Park underwent a transformation. Nuisance bears were dealt with. Garbage was securely locked up to keep the bears from associating people with food, and park management received a much-needed overhaul. Number 3. Mary Pat Mahoney, September 22, 1976 on a fateful afternoon, five adventurous young women set their sights on the trails to Swift Current and Iceberg Lakes in Glacier Park. Their destination was the Many Glaciers Campground, the ideal starting point for these breathtaking trails. Upon arrival, they eagerly inquired with the ranger on duty about the trail conditions, only to be misled. Unbeknownst to them, the ranger failed to disclose that these trails were closed due to increased bear activity a piece of critical information that would soon prove fatal. At 5.30 that evening, the group reached their campsite and made their way to the trailheads, only to discover the closure. Their disappointment led them back to the campground, where they sought answers from Ranger Fred Reese. In the early hours of September 23rd, 22-year-old Mary Pat Mahoney was jolted awake by the sound of their canvas tent being viciously torn open. She immediately roused her tentmates, Pat and Barbara Tucker, knowing all too well what lurked outside. It was a bear, determined to breach their shelter. Without warning, the bear slashed through the canvas and thrust its head inside. Terrified screams pierced the night as the girls realized their peril. The bear lunged, seizing Mary by the leg and dragging her from the tent. Her friends desperately tried to intervene, but the bear disappeared into the darkness. Mary's terrified cries echoing through the campsite. She was swiftly carried across the open grassland into the forest, the bear's speed and strength astonishing. In the woods, the bear clamped its jaws on Mary's neck and her screams fell silent. With limited staff available, only Ranger Reese was on duty. He urgently summoned another ranger and together they raced to find the missing woman. Tragically, they arrived too late. Mary had succumbed to her injuries during the night her lifeless body lying near the base of a tree. As dawn broke, casting a golden glow on the woodland, the two rangers made a grim discovery. Yet their ordeal was far from over. Two young grizzlies, just two and a half years old, charged at them. In a heart-wrenching turn of events, the rangers were forced to shoot the young bears to ensure everyone's safety. Number four and five, Jane Ammerman and Kim Eberly. July 23, 1980. Four years later, in the summer of 1980, two young adventurers, Jane Ammerman and her boyfriend, Kim Everly, embarked on a camping trip from Lake McDonald Lodge, where they worked. Their destination was St. Mary, a charming settlement at the eastern entrance of Glacier National Park, overlooking a breathtaking lake and surrounded by majestic mountains. Rather than opting for the campground, this daring couple decided to camp alongside the serene Divide Creek, illegally venturing off the beaten path. The area held irresistible attractions for bears, including the inviting stream and a nearby garbage dump where a decaying horse carcass lay. As night descended, Jane and Kim settled into their tent, but soon found it unbearably hot. They opted to sleep under the stars, exposing themselves to the wild. In the early hours of July 24th, they were awakened by rustling and clattering. Something was rummaging through the garbage a few hundred yards away, its footsteps drawing nearer with each passing moment. The youngsters could sense a large, prowling presence. Then came the eerie clacking of jaws as the bear lunged at them. Kim fought valiantly against the bear, but one powerful swipe of its paw left him unconscious, and he never regained consciousness. Yet the nightmare continued for Jane. She bravely struggled, but with each bite and claw slash, the bear inflicted grievous wounds on the 19-year-old girl. Semi-conscious and rapidly losing blood, Jane was dragged into the underbrush. 
Her lifeless body was discovered by two fishermen by the creek 60 yards from their camp. Park rangers later found Kim's body nearby, both victims partially consumed. News of this gruesome incident sent shockwaves through the park, but tragically, it was not the end of the bear attacks in Glacier National Park that year. Just two months later, disaster would strike again. Number 6. Lawrence Gordon, September 26, 1980 at 33 years old, Lawrence Gordon was an avid outdoors enthusiast, lured by the untamed wilderness of Glacier National Park, despite hailing from Dallas, Texas. His plan was simple, a solo camping and hiking expedition, a rendezvous with nature. He secured a backcountry camping permit from park rangers on September 26, 1980, with the intention of departing on the 30th. However, that fateful day would never come for him. The situation suggests that a bear was hanging around because it smelled food, garbage, and humans, which intrigued it. Lawrence, who knew what to do if he saw a bear, should have stayed quiet and still, but something went wrong. The bear attacked him very fiercely and wouldn't stop. It was clear from the mess in Lawrence's campsite how strong and determined the bear was. Lawrence tried to defend himself, but the bear wouldn't give up. This bear wasn't just any bear. It had caused problems before. A tag in its ear showed that it had been caught and moved from Swift Current in 1978. It had a history of bothering people and had shown worrying behavior. While the bear attacked Lawrence, it left deep claw and tooth marks all over his body. Then it dragged in 270 feet from his tent to the shore of Elizabeth Lake where it started eating him. In early October, they found Lawrence's body in a wild part of the park not far from the Canadian border. We don't know exactly when he died, but it was probably in the last few days. Rangers searched hard for the bear that did this. Then they got a scary report. Another group of backpackers had to hide in a tree because an aggressive bear was chasing them. They realized it was the same bear that attacked Lawrence just a day or two before. Rangers from Glacier National Park and Waterton National Park in Canada rushed to the area. They found the bear and sadly had to put it down to keep people safe. Number 7. Charles Gibbs, April 25, 1987 On April 25, 1987, aspiring wildlife photographer Charles Gibbs and his wife Glenda were hiking on Elk Mountain within the park. 40-year-old Charles had been trying to take the perfect bear shot for some time now. His goal was to have his photographs published in the Hungry Horse News. On that fateful day in April, Charles's chance of a best bear shot finally came. At 5 p.m., when he and Glenda were finishing their day's hike, the couple spotted a grizzly sow and her three cubs. Charles stepped closer to the bears. The mother stopped and stared at it. She was naturally protective of her cubs, but Charles didn't heed her warning signals, and even as the sow turned to move away from the intruder, he continued to follow her. Glenda knew this was dangerous, and she implored Charles to take a step back and let the animals be. Charles ignored his wife. So while Glenda made the smart move and walked back to the car, telling her husband she would wait for him there, Charles continued to pursue the bears. It was incredible scenery, and clicking away, Charles knew that these photos he was taking simply had to be accepted by the hungry horse. But he was risking life and limb for the shots and it wasn't long before the female became too anxious by the man's persistence. She was very protective of her young. She had already tried to walk away from Charles, leading her cubs to safety, but he was relentless in his pursuit. Eventually, the grizzly had had enough and turned back toward Charles. She charged at him. Even in full charge, Charles managed to still click away on his camera. The final photo he took is a calling reminder of the lengths he went to to get that perfect shot. The female is seen tearing towards him over the steep rocky mountainous terrain. Her ears are pinned down, her three cubs are right on her tail. At the last second, Charles abandoned his camera and scrambled up a nearby tree, but he had left it too late. The sow leapt up the tree after him and pulled him to the ground. She mauled him, her protective instincts strong. Charles never pulled his gun from his holster. He never attempted to defend himself. Instead, the bear ripped his arms and legs, tore into his face and neck, leaving deep, gaping wounds. 
his dramatic photograph of the Grizzly family rushing toward him, the last he ever took, was finally deemed good enough to make it into the Hungry Horse News. It was published along with his terribly sad story of how it came to be. Number 8. Gary Godin, July 23, 1987 Gary Godin, a 29-year-old nature lover from Dane, Wisconsin, was living his dream in Glacier National Park. He worked as a night auditor at Swift Current Lodge Inn in East Glacier Park, right next to the wilderness he adored. His work hours were from 11 p.m. to 7 a.m., leaving his days free for hiking adventures. On his days off, Gary would lace up his hiking boots, grab his camera, and explore the park's stunning landscapes. He loved this routine, but when heavy rains and snow confined him indoors for three days, he grew restless. Fortunately, the weather cleared just in time for his day off on July 23, 1987. With no specific return time, he told friends and colleagues that he planned to hike the Apikuni Cirque and perhaps even Mount Henkel. A colleague saw him walking to the trailhead, but that was the last sighting of him alive. The hike to Apikuni Falls was tough but rewarded him with breathtaking views. Along the way, Gary filled his water bottle from a clear spring. He continued to Apakuni Cirque, where he could overlook Nataki Lake. To reach it, he had to do some bushwhacking and scrambling, the kind of challenge he relished. No one knows precisely what transpired that day, but evidence collected after his death suggests the following scenario. Gary, enjoying the sights and sounds of nature, pushed through the bushes toward Nataki Lake. He was familiar with the area, having hiked there before. Unbeknownst to him, he was heading straight toward a grizzly bear. Being upwind, the bear didn't catch Gary's scent in the air. It wasn't until he emerged by the lakeside that she noticed him. The grizzly was caught off guard. She had been startled, and without much time to react, she charged at Gary. He attempted to climb a nearby tree to escape, but as he ascended, a branch snapped, sending him plummeting to the ground. The bear wasted no time, and she pounced on him. This was a stark contrast to Gary's earlier encounter with a female grizzly and her cubs a few weeks prior, which had been peaceful. In this terrifying turn of events, the bear's powerful blows knocked Gary around, threatening to render him unconscious. He cried out in pain, but the bear's jaws clamped down on his throat, ending his life. When Gary failed to return to work the next night, his manager reported him missing. A massive search operation was launched, involving 24 national park personnel, a helicopter, three sheriffs, and scent dogs. Missing person signs were posted throughout the park. The search continued until July 31st, but yielded no results. Weeks later, on September 1st, Gary's partially consumed remains were discovered near Nataki Lake. Nearby, scuff marks around a tree suggested Gary had tried to reach safety breaking branches in the process, but was caught and fatally attacked by the bear near the lakeside. It's heartbreaking to think that Gary put up a solo fight and his body remained undiscovered in the wilderness for so long. Number 9. John Petrani, October 3, 1992 Buck Wild was an avid photographer. He was drawn to Glacier National Park for its unrivaled beauty and outstanding wildlife viewing opportunities. But on October 3, 1992, he was about to witness something that would haunt him forever. A wildlife encounter that he wished he had never experienced. Setting off from his lodge, he followed the meandering path on the loop trail, upper McDonald Valley. Clipped to his belt was a canister of bear spray. A short distance into his hike, he rounded a corner. There, on the track in front of him, was a tripod. It stood erect to the side of the path but Buck couldn't see the photographer. Then he stopped in his tracks. There, on the ground at the base of the tripod, was the camera. This was a strange sight. Buck couldn't work out what had happened or where the owner of the camera was. That's when he heard it. A deep-throated growling. He froze. He knew what that meant. It meant that there was a bear nearby. He unclipped his bear spray and stepped forward once more. Off to the side of the path was some disturbed foliage. As he progressed, the scene that unfolded became more unsettling. Peering beyond a large tree, he saw it, the body of a man lying lifeless on the ground. He stopped. There was no sign of the bear, 
but he knew it would be nearby. He knew they were very protective of their kills. He held his breath, listening and waiting. The attack hadn't happened long before, but the man was unresponsive. He was later identified as 40-year-old John Petrani. When he made it back to his lodge, he bumped into two other hikers and asked them to contact rangers while he remained at the lodge to warn others. Not long after, a chopper whirred overhead. Rangers landed on the ground and made their way to the kill site. John's body had been dragged further away by the bear and had been partially covered by soil and vegetation. When the rangers approached his body, a female bear and her two cubs rushed at them before stopping just 50 feet away. It was clear that this was likely to be the bear responsible. Number 10, Craig Dahl, May 17, 1998. Six years later, Craig Dahl left for a hike on May 17, 1998 in the stunning Glacier National Park. He was a 26-year-old employee in the park working as a concessions worker. But something went seriously, seriously wrong. It is likely that he startled a female and her two cubs. They would have been very hungry following their winter slumber and were foraging to build their fat reserves back up. A fully grown grizzly that is both hungry and protective is the most dangerous kind. With little time to react before the enormous beast came running at him, she would have bitten down with her canines and slashed him with her claws. Each strike of her paw was enough to knock a man out. It wasn't until three days later that rangers stumbled upon Craig's remains. They were cached in some undergrowth on a slope. From the evidence gathered at the scene, it was concluded that a female grizzly bear and her two cubs had consumed him. But it wasn't just any female grizzly. She was known to park rangers. Affectionately named Chocolate Legs because of her unique color, the bear caught the attention of park rangers when she was just 18 months old. She used to approach people in the park, which was a problem. However, instead of killing her, Rangers tagged her and moved her 20 miles away. It seemed to work, and she stayed out of trouble for many years. But when she turned 16, she started approaching people again. Wildlife biologist Daniel Carney confirmed she was responsible for Craig's death, using DNA found in bear scat near his body. They caught and dealt with her and one of her cubs. However, another cub, just two years old, and her child became a problem. He had learned not to fear people and even tasted human blood before. He was bold despite being small. He stalked a group of hikers and even charged at them before running away. When the hikers reported his behavior, rangers had to act. They found and got rid of him, just like they did with his mother and sibling. <laughs>